Welcome to our panel on the Culture Wars Redux. Um, we will first watch a short video, after which um, I'll introduce uh, the, the panel and our wonderful panelists. This line is for 2 o'clock only. You need a pass to get in to see the exhibition. The response to this exhibition here at WPA has been completely overwhelming. We really had no idea that so many people would come and we'd get so much support for the exhibition you know, from the public at large. I think since we opened the show two weeks ago, uh, over now 27,000 people have come through the doors at WPA. I mean, we've never had such numbers. Uh, in any one day, maybe uh, as many as 2,000 come through and see the exhibition. On weekends, sometimes more. And overwhelmingly, the response has been positive. Uh, I've talked to people with different ideas about it. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, think it's kind of tough. A few of the works in the show, and, and there are things that they're maybe not used to seeing or, or make them feel a little bit uneasy, but they're willing to, I think, look for themselves to try to understand different aspects of, yeah. of American life. I think many people are actually voting with their feet. They're saying, Jesse Helms, we can decide for ourselves. You don't have to tell us what we can see and what we can't see. Art is an important part of our culture, and these exhibits that create a great deal of excitement are important, and not all people are going to like it. Art is subjective to, you know, the person who views the art. People like Jesse Helms and other conservatives, when they tell you not to look at something, it immediately wants you, makes you want to look at it. He's conservative, he wants to control people. He wants to control what people think, he wants to uh, hide reality, and, and I think that uh, I think it's way off base. If I really uh, can kind of understand what Jesse Helms is doing, I believe what he's trying to do is you know, address some concerns felt by his constituency. Uh, I think it's important for people you know, like myself and the other people who are here to uh, come out and show that they don't agree necessarily with his constituency. And it's, you know, it's the way de democracy works. Everybody has a right to express their opinions. Uh, Jesse Helms is trying to legislate his opinions, and I think that's wrong. It's the business of Congress to preserve freedom, not put limitations on freedom. Frankly, I think that it, lawmakers are looking for every opportunity to get in the headlines, and I think they're looking for every opportunity to, um, to make political hay out of something. And I think they ought not to. I think that they ought not to. Now let's start with the fact that our show was all funded by private sources. The Corcoran show was all funded by private sources. And when Jesse Helms' staff was repeatedly calling the Corcoran, badgering and harassing and intimidating them to close that show, that was an act of outright and clear censorship. But the, Helm, the Helms Amendment, which tries to essentially vitiate and destroy the entire NEA program because it says that the NEA cannot fund any program that offends anybody. The American people are smarter than that. We've had thousands and thousands and thousands of people that have come through this show and made up their mind and they've looked at some very tough things. Admittedly, some things that you might not have shown your grandmother. But in fact, if you trust the people, and you trust people to make up their own minds aesthetically, everything will come out all right. And the NEA has been great because it's been a great addition to our society because it has permitted a number of things to be presented that are not stock, are not Norman Rockwell, they're not Hallmark cards. They are experimental and they're challenging. And the American people are perfectly able to look at those things and to evaluate them for themselves. I believe that, that the real key to uh, this whole issue of artists' rights right now is the fact that Robert Mapplethorpe's work was put up in Washington 
uh, two miles from the, the uh, halls of Congress where the debate over artist rights is going on. The uh, whole arts budget is a tiny percentage of the federal budget, and the amount of controversial artists that ever show up every uh, 20 years are also a tiny percentage, that um, you're, dis you're discussing something that is purely political motivation and has nothing to do with administering the country, which is really what they should be doing. Uh, first of all, I think to describe what art is or what it is not is extremely difficult to do. Uh, secondly, the amount of money I think that the arts get is uh, tremendously small, especially if you compare it with uh, defense budgets, for instance. Now, I know defense is necessary, but uh, when you consider billions and billions, I guess I heard a figure of more than $1,000 per citizen for defense and about 20 cents per citizen for arts or less. I think that's ludicrous. The principle that is involved here affects teachers, it affects educators, it affects scientists. Can, can the Smithsonian uh, carry on a show that talks about evolution, uh, which clearly will offend fundamentalist Christians? Uh, under, under the Helms Amendment, you can't have that. I would assume the nudity, um, the homosexuality that was portrayed would be controversial to some people, but if you look beyond that to what, to the photographs and how well they were done, then all that becomes so unimportant. The way it's presented, no, I don't consider it pornographic. He uh, does compose using uh, images which would be pornographic in other settings, I would say, but the way that they're presented, uh, it's just as a form that he's working with, as I interpret it. The quality of the photographs are really quite spectacular. The, um, the craftsmanship involved and um, the composition of the photographs are really quite striking. And then um, my mother and I also had a discussion at the end about the aspect of pornography and um, about the, the use of the children in those two images. And we had a little bit of, of differing views on that. Um, my thought was that the, the image of the little girl was not really pornographic. I mean, I asked my mother, does that mean that pictures she took of myself and my brother when we were children in the bathtub, you know, running around while laundry was being done, if that was considered pornographic? Um, I was a little, a little taken with the photograph of the boy because that seemed to be much more staged and that there was a lot more forethought to setting up the situation and saying, okay, we're going to put the chair here next to the refrigerator and the boy is going to pose naked. And I, I thought that was a little offensive. I didn't find it offensive, uh, maybe because I'm a mother and it didn't seem unnatural to me for the little boy to be in that funny position. You know? I mean, he wasn't doing anything to himself or to be provocative. There are about four pictures in there, in the, in the back room on the table, that shouldn't be there. I frankly think that someone, sh that, that really there is a question of judgment. And I don't think it added anything. I, th I, think, it, I think it detracted. If they want to put a, a thing outside of the exhibit saying this exhibit, just like on television, may have objectionable photographs in it, you may not want to take young children in it. If you are sensitive, you may not want to go into it and warn people, fine. But, but to not show it is also limiting my ability to go see it. And my morals may might not be the same as Jesse Helms, but who's saying that Jesse Helms' morals are the morals that are proper or right? I, I don't think art like this is for everybody. And and, uh, you know, if you don't like it, don't come. Um, I liked it. I thought it was really worth going to see. In a way, I'm kind of happy that they had a controversy because it, I think a lot more people went out and, and saw something that they wouldn't normally have gone to. Of course, I think that by the actions of the Congress, it sort of polarized people into having, forcing them to take a view on whether we feel that the Congress should be making aesthetic judgments or not. And I resent the government meddling in the arts. I think they have an, op an, op an obligation to support the arts. And I, but I think they're basically not artistic themselves, and they ought to keep their hands out of it, but let artists decide what is art. I've, I've found in, in talking to many people about this that most people don't really care what the artists have to say. For, for some reason, they don't care what these works are about. They don't care what Andres Serrano's work in which he 
uh, immersed a, a plastic crucifix in a jar of urine. They don't care what that's about. They care that he did it. And I think that if people would, you know, look at the work and really try to figure out what it was about, I mean, that's what artists want. You know, it's not just a photograph of something. You know, there's, there's many levels in which these things have meaning. Artists and uh, cultural institutions can't be pressured by political concerns to just, you know, uh, censor ourselves. We're going we're gonna to continue to do this kind of work and continue to, you know, make statements that we want to make. And they, they have to do with, with life, you know, with what it's about to be alive here. In this panel, we're going to um, go back a little so that we can um, come, uh, come to the present with uh, some, uh, some remembrance of, of what happened, and then we can um, talk about how things have changed or maybe not changed. Um, we have here some of the key players of 20-something years ago of the uh, notorious Maplethorpe retrospective, The Perfect Moment. And I'll give you a little bit of a context for those of you who don't have a living memory of that before I introduce the panel. And I also want to say that um, we also have a timeline, a detailed timeline of censorship since 1989, and it's out on the table uh, in front with other materials. So pick up a copy. Um, so what happened in, um, is in July of 1989, the Corcoran Gallery of Art, our host today, canceled Robert Maplethorpe's retrospective, The Perfect Moment, under pressure from Congress. They explained their decision as the determination to remain outside of the political arena and maintain a position of neutrality in a city full of politics. As we know, that backfired horribly, and the Corcoran was cast straight into the middle of the political arena which at that time was already quite heated by the congressional rampage over Andres Serrano's Piss Christ, the plastic crucifix submerged in a jar of urine that is a rather glorious photograph, but once you read the explanation of what it actually is, it becomes controversial and was made controversial by, um, by congressmen. The Maplethorpe Show, which was organized by the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia originally, before being discovered by congressional critics, had played successfully at the University of Pennsylvania and the Chicago Museum of Contemporary Art. No problem, until it was discovered as an opportune moment to attack funding in the arts on the part of conservatives who didn't like the arts to um, receive public funding, who still don't like that. Rejected by the Corcoran, the Perfect Moment exhibition opened a few days later at the Washington Project um, for the Arts, ironically quite close to the Capitol and to politicians having, uh, who <coughs> attacked the show. It had a very successful run. You saw the video which focused on that particular moment in history and uh, here's Philip uh, Brookman who was instrumental in bringing the show to the WPA and who you saw in the video in a slightly younger version. <laughs> uh, the, the case was um, at the already controversial show, which few museum directors were prepared to take after the Corcoran scandal, then came to the Cincinnati Contemporary Arts Center. But hours after the opening, on the 7th of April, 1990, the center and its director, Dennis Barry, who's with us today, were indicted for pandering obscenity and the use of a minor in nude materials. The case was the first such prosecution of an art gallery in U.S. history. The indictment cited out of 175 photographs, seven images, and I will show you those images. Uh, there, this starts with a protest in Cincinnati that's uh, uh, protesting the show. Uh, five of the images were, this is a self-portrait of Maplethorpe, notorious self-portrait Maplethorpe with the bullwhip. Uh, five of the images were documenting a kind of s and uh, gay subculture. And two of them 
were completely different. There were two images of nude children. These were the seven photographs, and here is Dennis Berry with his, uh, with the lawyer representing him, Lou Serkin, who is also here, uh, celebrating their victory in the trial. Can we have the lights on? <laughs> um, so, um, uh, Mr. Berry and the uh, Art Center uh, he directed were acquitted. But the arts and public funding for the arts remained a point of contention throughout the 90s. As politicians debated the value of art and whether public funding should go to art that may offend some religious groups. And the 90s were a kind of sad period. 20 categories of NEA grants were abolished between 1990 and 1995, and funding to the NEA plummeted as the Republican Congress made serious moves to eliminate the agency entirely. In 2000, however, the NEA was still around, even though its funding was drastically diminished. And at the time, to me in a sinister statement, Majority Whip uh, Tom DeLay told the National Press Club that the NEA is off the agenda for the current Congress. Why, one may ask, maybe the NEA was not doing what it should have been doing. Today, efforts to drastically reduce NEA funding and even eliminate the agency have, again, resumed, which is partly the occasion for uh, gathering this symposium. Recently, Sarah Palin made a remark on Sean Hannity, referring to NPR, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Humanities as frivolous things that governments shouldn't be in the business of funding with tax dollars. Renewed attacks on arts funding, as well as the recent censorship of the Hide Seek exhibition at the Smithsonian, bring up the question, are we facing a repeat of the 90s culture war, or are we at a different place today? And uh, we have convened this um, panel to uh, revisit the past, but with an eye to uh, what is going on today. Um, and I will now introduce the panelists. We'll have a discussion and then we'll open uh, to Q&A from the audience. So think about your questions. Dennis Berry, sitting next to me, is an internationally distinguished museum director, cultural historian, and an expert in popular culture. He's currently a principal of Berry Projects, a firm he co-founded with his wife, Kathleen, who's here which provides specialized services to cultural attractions, special exhibitions, visitor centers, and museums. Barry's museum career begins with 11 years with the Smithsonian Institution as Midwest Director of the Archives of American Art of the Smithsonian, followed by eight years as Director of Cincinnati's Contemporary Art Center. As a result of his involvement in the Maplethorpe saga, uh, Dennis Berry has become a central figure in the nationwide movement for freedom of artistic expression. However, he seems to have steered clear of the art world since. After uh, the Contemporary Art Center, he became the opening executive director of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and uh, Museum. Then he worked on the International Spy Museum in Washington and is currently working on the Las Vegas Museum of Organized Crime and Law Enforcement, better known as the Mob Museum. <laughs> Philip Brookman, who uh, you saw uh, 20 years earlier and today, is uh, today Chief Curator and Head of Research at the Corcoran Gallery of Art. Most recently, he completed work on a retrospective exhibition and book about British-American photographer Edward Mybridge for the Corcoran now traveling to Tate Britain and San, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. He has organized and collaborated on major exhibitions for other museums, including the Tate, the National Gallery of Art, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. He was previously senior curator of photography and media arts at the Corcoran. He founded the Corcoran's Department of Photography and Media Arts in 1994 and has held curatorial position at the Washington Project for the Arts, El Centro Cultural de la Raza, San Diego, and the University of California, Santa Cruz. He's also a photographer, filmmaker, writer, and editor. While at the WPA, he was instrumental in bringing the perfect moment after it was rejected by the Corcoran, after which the Corcoran ate up the WPA uh, and, <laughs> and hired Philip. <laughs> 
Uh, Brookman's essays and documentaries are primarily about issues of modern photography, media, culture, family, and visual arts. Uh, his recent films include uh, Mi Otro Yo, My Other Self, about Chicano art in California, shown nationally on PBS, and Fire in the East, a portrait of Robert Frank for the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and Houston Public Television, both of which he made with his uh, uh, wife, Amy Brookman. Um, Lou Serkin, next in our line of speakers, is a founding member of Serkin, Kinsley, and Nazarene. One of the nation, he is one of the nation's preeminent First Amendment uh, and criminal defense attorneys. In his over 40 years of practice, Serkin has consistently defended the free speech and constitutional right of countless individuals and businesses, including um, adult entertainment establishments. Um, uh, Dennis Berry is saying that he, he went all downhill after, <laughs> after the Maple Thorpe trial when he defended art and now he's defending uh, pornography. <laughs> Um, museums, artists, activists, and ordinary citizens in all types of cases. He achieved national prominence in 1990 when he successfully defended Dennis Berry and the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati against obscenity charges for displaying Maplethorpe's work. Serkin is a true believer and a tireless advocate. He has represented persons whose message was completely contrary to his own beliefs and has risked both his career and his physical safety to do so. The First Amendment requires really a principled position. He has even had to be escorted out the rear door of a courthouse to avoid being assaulted by citizens angered by the conduct of his clients. Serkin's most notable accomplishment was arguing before the Supreme Court on October 2001 in Ashcroft versus the Free Speech Coalition, in which he successfully challenged the constitutionality of the Child Pornography Prevention Act. It sounds like a good act, but it is not. Um, he has also represented artists charged with crimes, including morgue photographer Thomas Condon, and in total, he has handled more than 110 appeals in civil and criminal cases. And finally, Jane Livingston, who um, in uh, 1989, as associate director and chief curator at the Corcoran Gallery of Art, scheduled uh, Robert Maplethorpe's retrospective after its premiere showing at the Philadelphia Institute for, of Contemporary Art. In protest after the cancellation of the show, uh, um, Livingston resigned from the Corcoran and has been an independent author and curator ever since. Before coming to the Corcoran, Jane Livingston was curator of 20th century art at the Los Angeles Co County Museum of Art. Her exhibition for, um, for that museum include the first major museum exhibition of Bruce Nauman and the landmark art and technology exhibition. At the Corcoran, she organized more than 50 exhibitions, most with publications. She established the Corcoran as one of America's leading repositories and exhibitors of fine art photography. During the Corcoran years, 75-89, her commercially published books included Black Folk Art in America, Lee Miller Photographer, Odyssey, The Art of Photography at National Geographic, L'Amour Fou, Photography and Surrealism with Rosalind Krauss and Hispanic Art in the United States with John Beardsley. Livingston's most recent books and exhibitions include The New York School, Photographs, 1936-63, Richard Avedon, Evidence, Zelda, An Illustrated Life, Hospice, A Photographic Inquiry, The Art of Richard Diebenkorn, The Paintings of Joan Mitchell, and the quilts of G. Bent and Thornton Dial. It's, there are long intros, but these guys are, have done so much. It's, uh, I really wanted to do justice to it. So um, my first question to, to you is, um, can you just tell us in a few words what your personal experience was 20 years ago with the Maplethorpe exhibition? I'll start. Start. Uh, well, it's very interesting being here in the courtroom, we'll say, talking about this subject. And I feel a great bond with this institution, with Jane and the people I've found the, uh, on the stage. So what was my involvement? Well, I never go anywhere without my attorney. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so 
So Lou and I have been through a lot together. You know, it's, it, uh, going back to that moment, uh, the, per uh, the perfect moment and the Maple Grove show and when Jane booked it here. You know, those of us in the museum world at that time in contemporary art centers just thought it was another really good show. Okay, and, and Maple Grove was an important photographer and this was a well-organized show. And I was very excited to get it for uh, the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati and did not think of it as an unusual uh, exhibit for the kind of work we normally show. But it was that moment here in Washington that changed all the dynamics mm -hmm. of what ultimately would happen with this exhibition and with censorship. Uh, I remember sitting in a museum director's meeting in Providence, Rhode Island, and John Walsh, who was then the director of the Getty Museum and president of the Museum Directors Association, came in and he said, I have some terrible news to tell all of you. The Corcoran Gallery, Gallery has withdrawn from the Maplethorpe exhibition for fear of the political aspects of, of presenting the exhibition. And everybody just was in a buzz. I mean, there was a room like this, we were all like that, and a friend of mine from San Diego leaned over and he said, do you know anybody who's taking that show? <laughs> and I said, yes, I am. He said, I'll clean it up for the audience here. He said, you are so screwed. <laughs> um, and I was. And, um, um, because of all the things that happened here, and then as Maplethorpe, the show went on to other venues. I mean, this built around the country. And maybe it's hard for some of you who are relatively young to understand the phenomenon, especially in light of the kind of not so much fire and, brick and activity around what just happened at the Smithsonian. It was built and built and built, and it kind of consumed the whole museum and art world. And then, uh, by the time it got to Cincinnati, we knew we were in for a gigantic battle. And so uh, for me, even months, I mean, uh, the show finally opened in 1990, and we were talking about an incident that occurred in 1989, 70, yeah. so, we knew for six, seven months that we were going to go through a major, major battle. And we didn't know we were going to wind up in court. We didn't know that we were going to have 30,000 letters sent to us. We didn't know we were going to have our funding cut off. We didn't know that there were going to be threats against our family members at that time. But little by little, it became very evident to us that this was the kind of world we had entered into. And that it was a very dangerous world. And it was a world that actually consumed a community. Unlike, I think, anything that had happened before in terms of issues of pornography or issues of censorship. So for me, uh, Maple, the Maplethorpe trial, or the Maplethorpe exhibition and the resulting trial were probably not quite two years of my life and, and still stays with me 20 years later. My wonderful attorney uh, emailed me back in October saying, it's the anniversary of our acquittal. I was trying to forget that, actually. But, uh, but you know what? As, as Robert Stoy said so beautifully, you think you're through with politics, and you're never through with politics. And these issues, some, some way, in some form, in some shape, come back into your life. So while, I, while those were the key moments, you know, kind of fighting that battle in Cincinnati and, and winning the case, um, uh, the issues and the ideas and the concerns of First Amendment of the First Amendment have always stayed with me. And then I'll say one last thing. Uh, yes, I did. I did leave the art world, and we can talk about that later if you like. But it was very interesting. Uh, I left the art world, and my next job was the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum in the building. And one of the reasons I got the job was my defense of the First Amendment, because all these rockers were out there having all their music censored. You know, and, and the committee, I, it was a great committee, but the committee was just like, wow, you know, like, this guy will defend, the, you know, defend our right to, to write and sing potentially bad music. And so, uh, anyway, that's my story. I think I'll tell the story of uh, how the Maplethorpe Show came here with a little bit of background. Um, actually, the whole thing was part of a, of a, of a bigger battle. Um, it's hard to, re to remember, but as recently as the late 1970s, sort of establishing photography as an art form on equal terms with other art forms, particularly painting and sculpture, was itself a, a bit of a frontier. And coming to Corcoran from Los Angeles, where I hadn't been particularly a champion of the medium as a full-fledged artistic form, um, I soon 
uh, got a sort of zealot's um, missionary fervor about this issue. And I also thought the Corcoran was a place in the context of Washington, D.C., on the Smithsonian and other museums, that really could carve out a bit of a unique, uh, separate and independent uh, contribution in the city by focusing on photography. And there were a few things that had happened in the past at the Corcoran, namely the acquisition of the O'Sullivan um, Western Landscape Survey photographs by William Wilson Corcoran himself. Those were here. Um, uh, there was a sympathy uh, in general in this community, partly through uh, John Gossage, who was uh, just a, lived here and was a photographer, but was, was sort of had his feelers out. Lee Friedlander, who was a friend of mine, uh, was somebody I brought to Washington to talk with me about making the Corcoran more of a presence in this field. And Roy Slade, who had been the director, um, in fact was the director when I came from Los Angeles, had applied for and received a grant from the National Endowment of the Arts to do a project called Photography in 1976. It was a bicentennial exhibition celebrating the nation's capital, in fact, the founding of the nation in 1776. And his plan would allow for 12 photographers to come in the year 1976, each for a, a month, photograph the city. And then the photographs would maybe or maybe not be shown, but they would be put in a time capsule in the lower depths of the Corcoran Gallery and then pulled out um, in another hundred years and shown uh, to sort of so the people of the future would know what the city was like in the year 1976. <laughs> so rather than use uh, the hundred thousand dollars, which is a huge amount of money from the NEA at that point to do that, I sort of convened a committee that included Lee Friedlander and John Gossage and some others to decide what to do with that money. And in, indeed we using two little corner galleries of the Corcoran, we started what would become called Photography of the Corcoran. And we, we commissioned eight photographers, 12 was simply too many, including uh, Jan Groover, Tony Hernandez, Roy de Carava, uh, John himself, Lee Friedlander, um, I can't actually remember all eight of them, but they came and each, oh, Robert Cumming, they each photographed in the city. We had eight little shows with eight little eight by eight inch catalogs. And that became a series of exhibitions that I think went on to become, I don't know, Sally Mann's first exhibition was in that series. Um, many wonderful, Jerome Liebling showed in that series. Many, it was a wonderful little series. And each, each had a catalog and I wrote for each. Um, that interest, led me into um, the establishment of, a, of, a, of a, actually a conference that happened at the Corcoran called Photography Where We Are, again, funded by the NEA. We had people like Susan Sontag, John Sarkovsky. Um, it was a major event at the Corcoran with major leaders in the field. And one of the excuses for this symposium was an exhibition which I curated and initiated of the collection of Samuel J. Wagstaff, Jr. Sam Wagstaff was an interesting character, a curator initially like me, very much on the cutting edge of contemporary photography, uh, contemporary art, not photography. He was a curator at the Wadsworth Athenaeum and did the first major exhibition of Tony Smith and many other pioneering. Sam was a very brilliant guy. Sam met Robert Maplethorpe in the early 1970s, and it was a life-changing experience personally for both Sam and Robert. Robert persuaded Sam to get interested in photography as his sort of next passion in terms of collecting. Sam had independent means, great passion, great intelligence. Um, through Robert and many others, uh, began to get very interested, particularly in 19th century photography, Atche, Le Gray, all of the great early pioneers were on Sam's radar screen. Sam collected brilliantly, quickly, uh, amassed a fine collection. We showed it for the Corcoran at its first, at, at first time ever shown. And people probably have forgotten this, but in the context of showing that exhibition and hosting the symposiums of photography where we are, we hung Ex uh, photographs of Robert Maplethorpe as an independent show in the same galleries where the series called uh, Photography of the Corcoran had happened. So Robert had a show in that series and was the only show at the Corcoran um, 
either in that series or any other kind that I originated for which I did not do a catalog. There simply wasn't time. I didn't have the resources to do that at that point. So we didn't do a catalog, but it was there. And so Maplethorpe had already had a little bit of history at the Corcoran. Janet Carden actually was the organizer of the exhibition that became um, The Perfect Moment. Janet contacted me very early on when she was doing the show, organizing the show, and I was one of the first people to sign on to the tour. Um, another little point of background, um, when Robert and I and Sam all became friends, we actually spent quite a bit of time together, and Robert came to Washington at least twice and maybe more often, and when he did, he stayed at the home of a great patron of the Corcoran and friend of mine, Mary Swift. Mary was a very active supporter of the arts in Washington, and the first time I saw what would become known as the X portfolio, which were the, um, the photographs that caused so much furor, um, was actually at Mary Swift's home in Washington, and, and Robert had just made these things, and I was, I was, I was uh, arrested by them and interested in this. So. <laughs> And I very well knew what, what I was getting into, uh, therefore, ergo. Um, then I'm going to skip, and I'm not going to be too much longer, because I know that was a bit of a long background. But it's good to understand all of the context, I think. Um, and most people probably just didn't even know all of that. Um, when, um, when Christina Orca Hall came to the Corcoran, uh, the show was obviously already well in the books. And two things I want to establish about that. One is that. One of the acquaintances of Christina Orca Hall, um, somebody she had known previously, just socially, I believe, um, was uh, a congressman named Dick Army, Richard Army from mm -hmm. Texas. And I believe, and I, Christina Orca Hall isn't here to, to, to speak to this herself, but I believe that it was through Congressman Army that Christina Orca Hall first heard about um, the the, the attention that Jesse Helms was playing, giving to this exhibition. And one thing I should say about the funding of the ex exhibition by the NEA, Jim Fitzpatrick, who's the lawyer who speaks in that tape, says categorically in that, that the Corcoran, I think he says, the Corcoran showing of the exhibition was not at all funded by the NEA, it was only through private sources. But he may not have used the name Corcoran Gallery. In fact, the exhibition when it was organized by Philadelphia, the Philadelphia University, the college of the, of the university is in Philadelphia itself. Um, when that was organized, I think Janet raised about $100,000 to execute the show and catalog, and 30,000 of that came to her in support of the Maplethorpe exhibition. So the funding of the show after that point, technically, was actually done by each, each of the participating exhibitions, of course, including Cincinnati, including Chicago, who took it after the Corcoran. Um, uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention, though, um, about all of that is that when word came about that the director, my director, had some questions about the show, I was peremptorily assigned to journey to Philadelphia to see the exhibition and to report back to my director and trustees my, my views on how it looked in its installation. So I got on the train, in fact, with a curator that had just recently been brought to the Corcoran and who had actually worked before with Christina, Terry Sultan. Terry, Terry Sultan and I got on the train, traveled to Philadelphia, went to see the exhibition, and they had chosen, and this was, again, the opening venue of the show, to display the X portfolio, but not the, the, the two children. The, the, the children's photographs were integrated into the body of the show, and then there was a little separate space that had a disclaimer as a wall text that basically said, um, the, the images that you were going to see from this point forward may not be appropriate. And I think it may have said for children under the age of 18, or I think it may have mentioned children as a participant, but it, it may not have, but it said, for some viewers, something like that. And then the, the export solely was, was in a sort of case, um, and it was shown in that way. And I frankly wasn't very happy about the idea of displaying it that way here. Um, 
I didn't, I was a little uncomfortable with sort of segregating those images. Of course, as it came out, my slight, you know, reservations about that were never, they were never tested. I didn't have to, to, to go to battle on that front, to say the least. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Obviously, you know, what happened, happened. I did uh, resign. It was a very high profile resignation. Uh, actually, the story that announced the, my departure was actually on page one of the Washington Post, not page one of the art section, page one of the general edition of the Post. Um, and there was endless publicity. I, I have a, I found a couple of clippings, a couple of articles about that time, including the one in which Christina makes her famous uh, statement and brought those. So I have some quotes uh, right from the horse's mouth from that time. But I think I will make that my opening remarks. So we can return to other the other issues later. Thanks. Philippa, you want the, the lawyer? I don't want to be a prior restraint, so I should let everybody speak first and then I'll defend <laughs> Philip? Yeah, I, I mean, I can tell you my experience, which you actually saw, um, you know, a bit uh, on the video. Um, and I, I've been, you know, thinking a lot about sort of remembering back to that time 22 years ago now. And um, I remember, uh, you know, uh, waking up in the morning, June 14th, I think it is, uh, 1989, and uh, in the Washington Post, probably not the front page, but you know, in the yeah, cultural so. section, yeah. um, reading uh, about the Corcoran's cancellation of the Robert Maplethorpe exhibition. Um, not an exhibition that was in any way on our radar. I'm working for a Washington Project for the Arts as a curator, and at that time, it's an artist organization um, with a mission, you know, artist directed, so the people working there are really artists. And our mission is primarily to um, help uh, young and emerging artists to create new work and exhibit it. And so Robert Maplethorpe is certainly not young and emerging at that point. He was extremely well known uh, in 1989 and a very high profile um, artist. So. When, um, when I and others working at WPA read about the cancellation of the exhibition, uh, we came together very quickly and I think everybody had the same idea, which was uh, we should show it um, at WPA because, I, I think because we could. Um, in some ways uh, we had a uh, interesting and I think um, you know, professional exhibition space in which we could um, present in Washington uh, work, works of art that people were being told that they should not see. That was our sense of it then. Uh, that here was an exhibition that for political reasons was uh, in a sense censored uh, because it was not uh, to be shown uh, at the Corcoran. And our sense then I mean, quite immediately was that uh, we could do this and make a difference and, in a sense, stand up and, and say, uh, you're being told you can't see these works. I think at the time we didn't know what the works were either, you know. Uh, but, um, but we could show them uh, and make them available for people so that you could make up your own mind about them. Um, and in some ways that was a kind of, I mean, looking back, it was a kind of provocative political um, move on our part to to make that decision. Um, I didn't understand then the the complex politics involved in um, the cancellation of the show or the uh, you know the pressure that had been put on uh, people and the the kind of rationalizations that were used to um, uh, to deal with all of this. So um, very quickly. Um, staff and board, and I, I want to credit uh, Jock Reynolds, then the director of Washington Project for the Arts, and of course board members, Jim Fitzpatrick, who you saw, was one board member of WPA then, uh, and others came together, and we made a decision right away that we would show the exhibition. And uh, within, I mean, within a day, maybe a few days, we had raised enough money to do it, to actually, you know, pay the fees and present the exhibition uh, in a, you know, in a professional way. And some of us had the experience, I think, to be able to, to put it together.
quite quickly. And uh, it wasn't, um, wasn't immediate, but within a few weeks of the time the exhibition was to open here <coughs> in Corcoran, it was on view at, at Washington Project for the Arts. Um, a very high profile um, exhibition. Uh, it was reported, of course, in newspapers and media and internationally, really. Um, something we were not at all equipped or prepared to, uh, to handle. You probably had the same experience. Very nice. um, but, uh, you know, my memories are, you know, a very significant opening event with, you know, um, Maplethorpe's friends. By, by this time, he's, he's died of AIDS in um, the time the show opened here. And um, so his friends and the Maplethorpe, you know, entourage, I could call it, um, were, were at the opening. Many people from, uh, from this city and from New York uh, had come really in support of him as an artist as much as uh, in support of, of um, you know, the, the idea that, that the show had been, had been censored and then shown again. Um, and, you know, it, it became, you know, I mean, I don't myself like the, the kind of military terminology that, that uh, gets used, but, you know, I mean, it was referred to as a kind of firestorm of, of um, you know, of attention uh, at that time. I mean, there were uh, uh, a lot of coverage and uh, a, a lot of events around the exhibition, and my memory is now um, in excess of 20,000 people uh, saw the show uh, in Washington in 20, 20 days or 21 days. We could only have it open for a short time because I think that our schedule was only open for that time. And um, other things I remember, certainly the, um, the media attention um, was extremely complex and um, very quickly we learned and, and were trained to uh, respond to the politics of the situation. I mean, it seemed very quickly that uh, the issues around the show um, were not at all about the art. You know, and I, I say this um, 20 years ago. Uh, it was very much about the politics. And uh, in our minds then, and I still feel this way, the exhibition um, was, uh, in a sense, uh, an, an easy target for um, a conservative um, uh, group of politicians to, to attack uh, in order to get attention really for their own issues. Uh, and their issues included um, redu reducing or eliminating uh, funding for the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, this then was something in the air because of um, uh, the uh, controversies over Andre Serrano's work and other exhibitions uh, in New York. I remember an exhibition at Artist Space uh, that had come under attack. A number of exhibitions that had received funding, any funding, minimal funding, from the National Endowment for the Arts uh, were under attack. And that was, you know, a kind of clear political um, incentive. Um, so, you know, a lot of uh, media coverage, as I said, a lot of political attention uh, to the exhibition. People did come uh, to see it, and really the question then, you know, among uh, the, the pundits, I would call them, was, um, is it art? You know, and you, you talk about having, you know, a, a kind of mission of, um, in some ways, um, elevating photography to the level of art, you know, in the early 1970s at the Corcoran, which, um, you know, was a time when, you know, that was still a question, is it art? And, um, and I remember, you know, people coming and, uh, you know, paying attention to the exhibition and saying, I, I don't like it, but it is art. And, and that becomes certainly a, an issue in, in the defense of of the, uh, the freedom of expression and First Amendment issues. Um, so I, I want to conclude. I mean, these are just some of my memories of, you know, there are many, and, you know, and many 
uh, issues that, that kind of fall out from all of this right after uh, WPA shows the exhibition, you know, including uh, its continued tour and then the, the um, uh, again, firestorm, you remember that word? Of, uh, <laughs> yeah, health storm. Health storm, <laughs> yeah, uh, in Cincinnati. Um, but, you know, I, I'm thinking very much about the, the ways in which uh, people, especially politicians, in some ways justified the attacks on, on works of art. And uh, it really did have to do with, in their minds, um, you know, why should American taxpayer dollars, small as they might be, uh, be used to, uh, uh, to exhibit or to create uh, works of art that we don't all think are appropriate. And, um, and I, I, I very much remember um, thinking about and hearing about um, how you know, an institution like the Corcoran then uh, should uh, not show uh, Maplethorpe's exhibition uh, because it would, because to exhibit it would endanger uh, funding for the National Endowment for the Arts. Can I just say one tiny little yeah. other thing? Um, before the WPA show opened, there was one other exhibition of the work which was projected um, by, with a laser projector created by a local artist, Rockne Krebs, on the side of the Corcoran building across 17th right. Street. I mean, that was a very symbolic and powerful moment at, at night. Yeah. To have those images a block from the White House, you know, on the on the, on the outside of the building. So. Yeah, and the, the images were projected up. It was actually along the facade of the building. Exactly and, right. And yeah. a number of us came and were part of. There was a, you know, it was a, a moment where the art community in Washington uh, did come together in some ways to defend um, the right of an artist to create right. images that they wanted to make and the right to show them. Um, so. I really bring this up in a way to, to think about how um, what happened at that time relates to um, what's happening today uh, with the, you know, the removal of a work by uh, another uh, artist, David Wanarovich, um, from the exhibition Hide Seek at the National Portrait Gallery. And maybe I should stop now because we could come back to, mm -hmm. um, you know, once we understand what happened in 1989 and before and after that come back to how what happened then uh, relates very closely to what's happening today. For me, it became pretty much a defining moment um, from the standpoint that for several years prior to that, I had been fighting censorship issues, particularly in Cincinnati, uh, to the point where adult entertainment was non-existent in Cincinnati, and, and I found myself beginning to travel and defending issues that were very difficult to defend in Cincinnati I was successfully defending in other parts of the country, such as northern Florida, Georgia, and other places, believe it or not, in Georgia. Um, I look back at the moment that, you know, it was, I devoted seven or eight months of my life primarily to defending Dennis and the Contemporary Arts Center with a partner of mine, Mark Mezabov. But the fears that I had in defending the adult industry and in the late early 80s and into the late 80s really came to fruition when the situation was coming to Cincinnati with the Maplethorpe because I had always said that censorship is a cancer. It's a, it's a, a, a real attack on freedom and that as you begin to censor one item, there's always somebody else that wants to censor another item until eventually he who speaks the loudest or has the largest dollars or influence um, will shut up everything. And I was always frightened by that, and I remember in a trial using a newspaper that was called the Community Press. And I said, you know, there's some people, look, this is an adult movie, who really cares about it? So we cut the line here. And I said, well, somebody else comes along, and they don't want this, and so you cut the line here, and ultimately you're left with merely what says Community Press, and it has no news in it. We won the battle. I don't know that we won the war, because the one thing that I remember, the elation that Dennis and I displayed at the, the not guilty verdict um, was a great moment. But later on, the other side, the moralists, began to realize that, look, we don't ever lose in these things, because we charge, we cost a lot of money to people, 
they are isolated from the individual factor of it, the, what it does to one's life to be on the line. Dennis was on the line for potentially, it was two charges, could have gone to prison for up to a year or to jail, could have been fined. And one of the fears that we had was is that one of the big things that was going on at that time in Cincinnati, because that was the home of the National Coalition Against Pornography and the Religious Coalition Against Pornography, and then the beginning of the Cincinnati answer to the American Family Association concerned citizens for community values. It was then the CCCV. Now it's just, you know, community value, you know, citizens or community values. They cut out one of the words. And they were out there saying, you know, I was addicted to porn and stuff is going to bring down America. We've got a censor. You know, there's got to be responsibility in people. And the idea of people being able to make their own personal choices uh, was really under attack. And they said, well, it cost a lot of money. They won that little war. But the reason they won it was is that the county shirked their responsibilities. Once the indictment came, because it was a misdemeanor, then the city of Cincinnati would have to take on the prosecution and not the county. And the city prosecutors were not, they were saying, didn't have the talent of our, our, you know, our, our county prosecutors. And that's why we won. We didn't win because we were the right side of the issue on that and that the battle that we had really gotten gathered together. And what happened as a result was is that the obscenity law in Ohio was soon after that change from being a first degree misdemeanor to becoming a fourth degree or fifth degree felony. And what I predicted many years ago when they started with the sexual registration things, I was saying publicly, you wait and see the next attack to frighten people and to create censorship is going to be we're going to make a finding of obscenity a sexually registratable offense. And, you know, looking back and saying, you know, my God, look what Dennis really could have been exposed to, you know, not being able to live in certain neighborhoods, having to register, you know, on a, a sexual registration list that goes on the, you know, on the internet uh, every six months and, and so on. And it would, would, was originally, you know, 15 years, but if you had good behavior, you could get yourself off that list after 10. Now it's up to automatically the minimum is 25 years. And when you travel to another state, out of Ohio, you have to register in that state that if you're going to be there for more than three days, that you are a sexual offender because you were a curator of, a, of an art museum. I was always baffled at the idea of how could they even be considering bringing an attack against the Contemporary Art Center, which was created in the early 1940s in Cincinnati and was a well-recognized art facility and was a member of the American Association of museums and museum directors, uh, there was an affirmative defense in the Ohio law. It said that, you know, if it's being presented at, an, you know, at a, a museum, I didn't know that you lose that status in the eyes of the law of a particular municipal court judge if you don't have a permanent collection. You were only a gallery and by, you know, some misfortune, the founders of the Contemporary Art Center used it and used to call it a gallery and not a museum, that now you weren't subject to that uh, affirmative defense. The other really shocking thing that I've seen is the progression that's happened, and I'm, I, I certainly, and, and the, the law that I oppose, the Child Pornography Prevention Act, I only really attacked a, a very small portion of that act, and that was the portion that said if you convey the, uh, the message that the particular film that you're going to see, or whatever it may be, gives the appearance of a minor uh, engaged in sexual activity, or if you use, even if you use an adult uh, to play the role of a minor, and they appear to be a minor, uh, that that violates the federal child pornography laws and have dr draconian penalties. And we were really concerned at that time that if this law continued into force, movies such as Lolita, um, American Beauty, Titanic would be banned because it gave, an, an, you know, gave the appearance that they were adolescents. Obviously, the name Lolita, uh, you immediately put that together with a child engaged in sexual activity with a, an, an, adult, an adult member of their family. And that, that would, you know, we wouldn't be showing it. The movie, the remake of Lolita did not play in the United States. Um, because of that law, 
And even after that law was attacked successfully, uh, it never really played in any American theater and only played on Showtime television. But what has really been the change is, is that there's a danger and exposure of showing the two pictures that were shown here today because the definition of child pornography and engaged in uh, sexual activity includes, along with using specific terms of sexual conduct, there's a catch-all or a lewd, lascivious depiction of the genitals. And that could be covered or uncovered, as subsequent cases have said. And so it becomes very frightening when you think about um, the idea that when you decide to take a, a picture of your child as a parent and you're gonna, you want to email it to your, your, to your parents, who would be the grandparents of the child, of your kid taking a bath or something like that, uh, could be considered by somebody to be child pornography. It's one thing to be charged with obscenity, but to be charged with child pornography, or you know, th there's no way you never win in that, and you're you're permanently scarred by it. But what I have the the, the moral majority has really, or the moral minority has really somewhat won the battle or the war, because we in a time of very much of self-censorship. Uh, we have forgotten the idea that we have the ability to make our own choices. If you don't want to see an exhibit like this, just don't come to it. You, you know, as long as you know what you're about to see. And what's frightening to me now is, is that there was very little publicity about the recent event in the National Gallery, the Smithsonian, whereas at the Maplethorpe, every newspaper in the country had it. It was top story. In Cincinnati, it was played. And when we got it out to the public and they understood it and they saw it, it became, we got tremendous support. 86,000 people came to that in a town that probably never drew to the, the, any exhibit at the art museum, any, probably 1,000 people, 1,500. The night that they had the preview showing, I mean, you know, tears came to your eyes because 6,000 people lined the walls of downtown Cincinnati to come in and the support and the outrage the Saturday morning when a, municipal, when a judge called me and said, I want you to know that an indictment has been returned. I've accepted it. You know, I'm, here's where I live. I will be available. Here's my phone number. If they make a physical arrest of Dennis, you call me. I will meet you and we'll sign a bond so that he, you know, he doesn't spend any time in jail. And it was an outrage in the city but as I say, I look back at it and I say it was a defining moment because I've continued to fight this battle and it's getting more and more difficult because it's getting more difficult for us to get past the initial stages in the court environment to be able to get, say, as I grow older and I get worried at the younger generation, you all have been brought up in an environment where the government oversees everything that you do and you so accept it. You're so open about what you put on Facebook. You're in the social, you know, communicating that way. We accept going through the line at the airport, exposing ourselves to x-ray and so on, and we're not outraged by it. We're not screaming about it. You know, the world freedom is a, is a costly thing, and there's a risk to be taken to be free. We've got to go back to taking that risk. We can't just look at people and say, I don't like the shade of your skin, you must be a terrorist. I, you know, I was involved in representing six kids who you know, were against the use of animals in testing and chemical development. And they ended up being in, going to jail anywhere from one to seven years because they formed protests and they boycotted and they said some outrageous things. But again, they should not have been silenced and they shouldn't be afraid to speak up. And that's what I hope you all get out of this, is go back and start to think about how can we regenerate that spirit that we had in 1990 and 1989 when people were really screaming. The Corcoran made a decision, everybody gave Jane a heck of a hard time over that period. And the Washington Museum took it Cincinnati, we got prepared for it because Dennis had the, the foreseeability, I'm going to have a problem, and he came to see me, and, and we worked together on it, and we came up with some ideas, and we shifted the publicity, and we really talked about, um, you know, let's get rid of censorship, but we haven't won the battle, and we haven't won the war, 
and we need a lot of soldiers. So I, I wonder what the rest of the panel thinks about that, about the issue mm -hmm. that Robert Storr also brought up, the issue of appeasement, that we're trying to, you know, in, in the attempt to save the NEA, uh, there has been this uh, consequence <coughs> of, of censoring oneself, of toning things down, and I want to quote the citizens for community values that were key in attacking the Maplethorpe show in Cincinnati that uh, Lou Serkin mentioned. In uh, 2000, they claimed victory. They said even though the, the case was lost for them, the original intent of the awareness campaign was to get the attention of the Contemporary Art Center and act them to act, uh, ask them to act responsibly. For the last 10 years, they have acted responsibly. How could we consider this anything else but victory? Does that, uh, does that responsibility that uh, the, a group like Citizens for Community Values sees in a contemporary art center, does that mean that the contemporary art center is really not doing its job to display challenging art? Um, also, what happened, I wonder what happened, what did, did this, uh, the whole um, uh, controversy in the early 90s mean for the Corcoran? What happened, you know, we know short term, the Corcoran's reputation was badly damaged. It, it uh, lost Jane Livingston. It's uh, uh, Christina Org Cahal had to resign at the end of uh, 1989. What happened long term? And what happened long term to the WPA, which had a very, very successful show, but then a few years later uh, couldn't maintain its funding, had to be incorporated in the Corcoran. So what are the long-term consequences? And are they so univalent? Are they just, is it, are we looking at uh, a loss? Are we looking at uh, something more complicated than that? And, and, and also, you know, talking about the Hide Seek show, I talk to people, they all say, well, the Voynerovich video was now sh uh, seen by so much more people than would have normally so they'd seen it. The Maplethorpe show was seen by way more people than would have normally seen it. But is this a long-term win? This might be a win for the particular work of art, but are the consequences of that um, a more insidious? And maybe Dennis could I'd address like that first. It's my favorite topic. <laughs> um, only because, you know, Svetlana uh, uh, is saying it and Lou said it. Uh, you win a victory, you win a battle, but you do lose a war. And I really felt the same way, not just because of the laws changing in Ohio about the nature of of uh, how much time you could get for pornography or child, uh, child pornography. I, I think about the battle in terms of museums and the art world and the cultural world and how it did regress after the Maplethorpe trial. Because there was such a, while people stood up, while there was a great outpouring, while there were moments like the WPA, moments where people resigned their jobs. I mean, this is a big, big time in, our, in the art world and the cultural world. Uh, at the end of the day, um, they did. They, they took a small institution in Cincinnati. The Contemporary Arts Center had a budget of, like, in those days, like a million and some dollars a year. And they exhausted our budget. They exhausted our funding. Uh, we couldn't get corporate funding. We couldn't get the local government funding. Um, I resigned a year or so later because it was very uncomfortable for me to be there anymore. And uh, so, and then you looked around at what happened to the general museum world and art world, and I do think it became very safe for a very, very long time in terms of programming. That's not to say that there were galleries that didn't show somebody's controversial, provocative work, but if you look at that period for 10 years, nothing happened. It's interesting that uh, Rob Storrs brought out sensation, because then it, that's the next bubble, and that's 10 years later. And, uh, and, you know, I mean, I've heard little moments here and there, but it's basically 10 years later. Not, you know, there was a, let's play it safe. Uh, and I think that's been the case, you know, maybe there's a little movement every now and then to do something, and certainly in the last few years, it, it got a little more open in its ability, or the art world, the museum world, to do some shows that were uh, interesting and maybe could be provocative. But I think here's the other aspect. In our society, what's provocative anymore? It's, you know, it's a very interesting moment that the art world for most of the time, the museum world most of the time, is really on the periphery of most people's thinking. I know we're all here having a good time, but uh, in truth, we're kind of, until something pops up 
uh, like, like the portrait gallery, we're really not in the focus of most people's lives, okay? I mean, people go on their lives, and so where they confront censorship or where they confront issues like this, it's television, it's the, it's the internet, it's school textbooks, it's those kinds of issues where this battle gets fought all the time, everywhere, and we're only occasionally in the radar. Uh, so I think we don't seem to count as much, and part of it is, again, um, that I think we took our di we took our dialogue away from the from the general public. When I when I heard this again, how we there were in defense of the Maplethorpe show, there were a couple of uh, uh, witnesses that we brought in who did talk about the formalism of of Robert's work and and tried to approach it that way. But that wasn't the issue. I mean, the issue really was could you show work you know that was provocative, showing homosexual acts. And we probably, we should have had, and uh, we did have everywhere else, that dialogue, not so much in the courtroom. And then I think now we just talk to each other. We, and we do talk in art speak. And the world, the art world has become more and more insulated in that way. And I, I applauded him to say, when you have these issues, talk about it. The, the sad thing about the portrait gallery is that they didn't engage in a dialogue. No, uh, no. They didn't engage at that moment in the dialogue where they could have, whether it was right or wrong, you know, the very act that they were showing, uh, doing an exhibition on homosexuality and relationships should have been the so, moment for all this. It's, it was somewhat heroic that they were yes. doing that to begin with. Yeah. And we have spoken about that afterwards because I really look back and I say it was a, it was certainly a political battle in Cincinnati. It was about homoeroticism. It was about the homophobia of Cincinnati yeah. and racism right. uh, because of the African American women, men with white women. And it clearly was that, and, and we've always spoken about that. And it wasn't just the formalistic aspect. And the jurors, it was about a museum. Yeah. Because I think afterwards, there were a half a dozen of the eight jurors who wanted, wanted to have a private tour of the CAC. And we had several members of the jury who had never been in an art museum, right. who became then cultural advocates. So it was, you know, we understood the political implications of it, and we certainly understood the political implications of the fear of the police coming in and taking pictures off the wall and taking evidence and holding it and not giving it back and attempting it someday to attempt to forfeit it is contraband. We stopped that. And that judge did not talk to me for years when I attacked her neutrality in giving a search warrant but in retrospect realized that she really protected the, the, the museum. But, I mean, I, I think that, we, you know, we understand that, that it was really, a, it was only a, a battle. And as I've often said, you know, that's only a small battle and we need to get together and I think to be responsible. And we need, I think this country needs the museums to come back in the art centers to fulfill their, their duty. You've got to be that that takes it to the limit and to show it and express it and let people make decisions on it and we need to get back to the media to support us. They have forgotten us and I, I just to ask for that. I just want to uh, remind us of one little uh, sort of thing that happened that really got a lot of news at the time but we're forgetting about it and it's easy to forget. But. Um, you know, Rob Store, I thought his remarks were really wonderful. Um, and he was very careful to sort of say, I don't want this to be ad hominem. I really want to start naming names. Uh, the one name that he did mention, though, was uh, Monsignor Donahue, who is this Catholic priest who actually was the one who rang the bell. Um, he was representing the Catholic League when he um, ob objected to the um, Wojnarowicz. Um, Piece, and that was the basis on which the Smithsonian Secretary reacted. It was coming from the Catholic community. Interesting that uh, Robert Maplethorpe was a Catholic, as of course was Andy Warhol. But the other one that we were sort of forgetting, and this is coming from another direction, um, again the Smithsonian, um, there was a Solowet retrospective, Solowet at the Museum of uh, American Art there, and there was a piece that was pulled by the director of the museum, Betsy Brune, a woman whose sensibilities were offended by a, a quote, peep show piece that showed a nude woman. You had to sort of peek into this box and you saw this. And that was a whole great big thing. In fact, that got every bit as much attention in the press 
as has the recent, um, the, the recent one. So I mean, you know, politically correct, politically incorrect um, things in our society. I remember writing this sort of essay, which was a, published as an editorial in the, in the Post, in which I sort of mused on the fact that I think the direction we're going in very, very subtly though, but, but dis dis distinctly and definitively is into a kind of dangerous self-censorship, yes. which is just rampant. And it's so interesting, I mean, uh, that my hero of this panel is this lawyer right here. Um, <laughs> And you know his observations about about this in, gen in general society, it, it is it, it is frightening, yes, it is. and it is the war that is being lost. Mm -hmm. Philip, maybe you can well, say a few, I, because we want to open for right. questions. I for just the uh, quickly say I think in the <clears throat> aftermath of the the culture wars of the late '80s, um, there there certainly was a chill in mm -hmm. in cultural communities as to what we could do or wouldn't do. And uh, museums began to uh, certainly self-censor, and um, also at the same time, the National Endowment for the Arts stopped funding um, artists directly. So they wouldn't give money to artists. They stopped. Uh, they, they very carefully um, looked at everything that they were going to fund to make sure that it wouldn't have any any. Um, content that could be provocative. What about the, the, I'm wondering about the absorption of an independent space like WPA in the Corcoran. What, what's the meaning of that and kind of the disappearance of uh, alternative yeah. art spaces? I think that's, very, that's complicated and, and <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how related it is really, but um, in um, 1994, that's when I came to work at the Corcoran and my interest was certainly in working in an independent nonprofit museum uh, because it was independent from the federal institutions, uh, which would uh, be less uh, open to, you know, all kinds of things that I might be interested in doing. And, um, you know, for me, it was, it's very much about the people in these organizations and who the people are. And I know that in um, the aftermath of Maplethorpe, the Corcoran really imploded. I mean, staff resigned, uh, board resigned. Uh, it, it was a very complicated time here. And then when a new director came, it was his job to rebuild the organization. And part of that rebuilding um, was to implement a freedom of expression policy that a new board um, passed and approved of. And so we still operate here um, under a freedom of expression policy, the, the, what, what happened at WPA, the changes that took place there, uh, took place after I had left WPA, I mean, some years after. And I think it had much more to do with the uh, funding climate for funding um, any cultural projects, but especially small nonprofit organizations like WPA. It was a very difficult climate um, because, in, you know, like it is now, the the, uh, um, the economy. Right. And, and of know, course, funding and censorship are economy. closely related because when, yeah. when you threaten to remove funding. Yeah, so uh, in, in a few years later, when, when WPA really collapses, um, the Corcoran was approached by the director of WPA. And I wasn't involved in this, but I can tell you what I know. The Corcoran was approached by the director of WPA to. Um, form a partnership, and that partnership uh, became a kind of, um, you know, like father-child relationship in some ways. The, the Corcoran was enabling WPA to exist within this building, helping to fund it in some ways, um, and you know, it completely changed the character of of an artist organization. In some ways, they were then. Um, only able to uh, do projects that you know the parent would approve of in some way. I had opposed it right from the start. I didn't think that would be a good idea for uh, Washington Project for the Arts to come into the Corcoran because it would change the character of a, a independent artist organization. Mm -hmm. so. so, questions from the audience? Um, uh, th there's a mic, so wait for the mic. <laughs> oh. so 
Okay. Um, it's very interesting to hear what you say about the, the specifics. I feel like there's a kind of overgeneralization going on, though, that there were, particularly for people who weren't around, there were other players who no longer exist in this drama, like the National Association of Artists Organizations, which was the lobbying group for um, uh, the alternative spaces and visual aids, which is where the idea for the projections in part came from. Um, so there was, this, there was this network of alternative uh, allies here at a moment before the contemporary was a category that museums exhibited. Um, you know, what it, if you were interested in performance and video, you didn't go to a museum in the 80s um, because they weren't presenting these kinds of things. And also I would say the situation has changed a lot. Svetlana knows that these incidents of censorship happen a hundred times a month. Um, it, and they never make the national press. Yeah. And they never yeah. make the national press, which was much more liberal then. And interestingly to me, it seemed like yeah. the museum directors, unlike Philippe de Montebello at the Met in the 80s, were very pro uh, the progressive forces here at the National Portrait Gallery. Likewise, all the editorial uh, directors at major newspapers. Virtually every major newspaper in the country ran an editorial about this. So in a way, I think it's a really complicated situation. And, um, you know, it art is, is used in other ways as a different kind of poem than it used to be. And, uh, I think we have to speak really carefully about it. It's very connected to the, to the press and the media because uh, censorship issues are, are embedded within their own concerns as well. Freedom of the press. Being well, I mean, just take the Janet Jackson complex. I mean, fortunately, to some degree, the networks have fought some of the battles with it and have taken them up, but it's been tremendously expensive and local stations have had some responsibility because each one that played it uh, gets individually disciplined or fined. And the amount of money that they were extorting uh, for the penalties that were being imposed, uh, again, were very, very large and the battle is very expensive. So it's easier. Uh, you need some community support to get relicensed and they all crumble. They need the corporate funding, they want the corporate support because they want the advertisers. In Cincinnati, uh, the Clear Channel got threatened by Anthony Munoz when, w, when the, the Clear Channel started to advertise the Hustler store. And he's a big active member, a former you know, NFL football player, but he's very active with the CCV. And they crumbled and they said goodbye to Hustler we're not going to take your ads anymore. It's dollars and cents. Everybody's fighting it. And you all get kicked to the side. The newspapers want to keep the ads to keep everybody happy. The Contemporary Art Center has got a magnificent building in Cincinnati now, but it's mellow. I mean, the exhibits, they're not, they, don't want, they don't want to create any waves. They needed to bridge the gap afterwards. I mean, Jane got forced out, Dennis eventually. There's not one person that stayed more than two or three years after the controversy from there, they left as quickly as they could get out of there. And, but they've got a gorgeous building. But it's interesting what you're bringing up. This is actually, we, we sometimes treat arts battles as, you know, in an isolated sense. But actually, they are a part of a much larger cultural battle. And maybe it's not only a battle about culture, you know, when uh, what we're all talking these days is the mural in, uh, the labor mural in mural in Maine, which the, gov the new government uh, governor of Maine uh, once removed from the Department of Labor because it represents a history of labor and that might be offensive to businesses. Uh, and this is happening as unions are being busted in Wisconsin. So uh, I wonder uh, whether the, the battle here should not be only about keeping pieces in museums, but about the culture at large and who owns this culture and um, and it's not only about culture obviously it's also about politics and ideology so maybe we should make it a well I mean it's always been that I mean you know and, yes there's a flashpoint you know in the art world but when this blew up in, in Congress with Jesse Helms and others I mean it was a much larger thing you know it really was about who controls the world at a certain time like, this, like the state of Maine and I, every, I don't want to go too far into this because every time I do, I, I sound like Oliver Stone. You know, <laughs> and, and you see conspiracy everywhere. But 
during this controversy, believe me, it's went all the way to the White House. Yeah. I mean, there, there were connections yeah. all the way to the Bush White House, okay, and the first Bush. And, you know, and who was funding the opposition, and who had the, and why it was prosecuted in a certain city, and where the funds were raised, and how, you know, why certain people were at a certain mm -hmm. place at the time. Anyway, yes, because it's, a, it's much more of a political fight than that, and, and clearly, you know, not that every Republican wants to destroy the NEA, but it's always been a battle yeah. between more liberal and less liberal about what the NEA stands for or what NPR stands for. Clearly, that's the, the next victim, uh, maybe before NEA. Yeah. And also just want to announce that we'll be extending questions to about 1.15, so there'll be plenty of time to get around. Um, public radio. You're being censored. <laughs> they won't survive on private I'm trying to, just, I don't know, it's disgusting. Oh, oh, Jane, your, your glasses. Jane, glasses. If you, your glasses are creating censorship. Oh. <laughs> it's a firestorm. Um, <laughs> I think the mic's still live. Um, I'd like to hear something about, from any of you or all of you, about the, the great paradox that has troubled me since Maplethorpe. I was out there watching the projections. Um, up on the walls um, back then, and I'm still here at the Corcoran Teaching, where incidentally I teach a course on the arts and values interpretation. And uh, we admit graduate students of any religious or per, uh, political persuasion, but yes, you better believe they're mostly progressive activists, um, trying to find what values in the arts mean on the progressive side. Um, here's the, the struggle that I've had, and yes, I think it is a war, um, I can say, um, as a quick anecdote, that two days before the attack came here, I was sitting in a private conversation with the director at the American Art Museum. Um, I'm just, we are friends. When she got a call from a volunteer who identified themselves as a volunteer calling from Jesse Helm's office to ask for her on the spot, unannounced, on her feet, defense of the um, enlarged maquette of the Rosenbergs in their um, execution chairs back to back, which were on the front steps of the American Art Museum two days before. It was very clear that they were cherry picking who they were gonna go after in the next day or two. I mean, this was a war. Um, the question I wanna ask is whether it is the fault of those who want to attack free expression or if we who want to defend it are playing into what to me is an important part of the self-censorship. Um, because there was so much firestorm, so much passion, so much um, a hasty response, so much you know, crisis, um, it was all about freedom of expression and it was almost impossible to get a good conversation going about the personal, attitudinal, ethical, moral, spiritual issues that Maplethorpe opened up, or that the Piss Christ opened up, or that the Madonna at Sensations. I tried to do it. I went and stood outside. I didn't know Phil was going to be my colleague. And asked people, let's talk about the works as you come out. And the whole issue was they're attacking our freedom of expression. No, 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 no. The point is that the artist created these works so that we as a human community could use those works in these museums and art centers as a forum for personal human discovery and for a social debate. And that's where I think the censorship battle has been lost, at least so far. Well, and that's exactly, I mean, when, when there was that Bradley Smith situation that happened in colleges, I guess around 1992 or 93, that the Holocaust didn't exist. And he wanted to put those ads in the school papers. And the controversy really came up. The University of Michigan really kind of answered it the right way. You know, you battle speech with more speech. You don't start attacking each other and saying, I'm right, you listen. We've got to learn to listen. We've got to teach the other side to also listen and have the dialogue. That's the whole purpose of the First Amendment, is to allow that dialogue. And we've got to remember that, and we've got to remind people of that. Let's not engage that my way is right or your way is right. Let's talk about it. 
and then let's make, make our own decision about it. And let's talk about the content of the work right. and what it means. Um, I have the unusual and coincidental uh, privilege of being the sister of your keynote speaker. And it took us four days over Christmas vacation to get from, we're on the same right. side on freedom of speech, let's talk about the content of the show. I agree. And it, it's, think about how much harder it is for anybody else to get there. But we've got to be talking about the importance, the significance, the issues that are in the art and show the public that that matters. And that's why it's worth defending. It's a, bi a big part of our job is to um, you know, help our audience to understand how to look at a work of art. And um, you know, looking is very much part of understanding. So you know, the, the content of the work and the meaning of just an example, ants crawling on an image of a crucifix. Uh, in a video um, could be very, very complicated. Uh, and yet it, it's used as a, a kind of iconic, you know, like taboo or something like that just to infuriate people. And people don't stop to think about what it means. I mean, it, it's very much our job to help in a dialogue that would engender an understanding of, of what that work means. It seems that a kind of complexity and ambivalence becomes uh, one of the casualties in, in the culture wars because on the one hand you have the simple sign, sound bites of the right and then the, the defenders of art are forced into a position of simplified defense and you cannot even say that you don't like something. <laughs> you cannot say that well maybe some of it does attack Catholics. Um, because you have to oppose a, sign by, a sound bite. So they're framing the conversation yeah. and we're in that frame uh, being led into a kind of this side and that side and complexity is lost. Is this working? Yeah. Uh, I think there's a virus in the well-meaning liberal art-loving community. And you mentioned the appeasement factor. But I think store. appeasement has this dangerous bedfellow, uh, the easy cynicism that says, oh, yeah, there's been a scandal, I know, and maybe, you know, liberties have been affected somewhat. But after all, more people have come to see the work and the show and visited the museum than would have come otherwise. So what's the big deal? Comments on that? I don't think anybody's saying what's the big deal. Uh, no, well, that, it is a big uh, deal. It is a big deal is, uh, because it's the aftermath. But I think man. that's why we should look at sort of short-term and long-term right. effects. Because in the short term, yes. I think sometimes people do calculate, you know, that they can create a show or an exhibition. I won't mention one, but it was mentioned in the earlier. <laughs> I'm censoring myself. It was mentioned in the earlier presentation um, that you know it's going to have a sensational. Uh, uh, impact, but I think most of us, you know, I don't, I don't think we're all that calculated all the time about that this is going to drop huge, huge audiences. I just, I don't feel that that's the case. That these acts are, these acts are more situational. It's, you know, you think, you think the work, you, you, you take a show, and there are a lot of curators sitting here. Take a show because you're bad. You think the work is good, or the theme is good, or whatever. You're not really. You know, you know that some shows are more sexy than others. You know that some shows are going to draw more people than others. Okay, but but I I remember at the end of this uh, ordeal in Cincinnati, a, a TV reporter asked me if it was a good career move. You know, <laughs> I'll tell you it wasn't. But um, but I mean that saw it only in the cynical yeah. sense. Saw it only as if you get your name in the paper, if you get 80,000 people, if WPA has 27,000 people, it's good for your organization or for you. I don't think they calculate that way. I, don't know. I, should, have, I should have clarified that I wasn't referring to you or the museums and talking about the audience, the consumer and they're left with the lack of outrage right. when, when we hear or read about the general. Okay. I, yeah. I was going to follow up on the same, the same point, uh, the collateral, collateral damage of culture war. Uh, and actually, there are life and death issues. Uh, you all uh, risked great things, but there are life and death issues 
that were fall out of the cultural war. The Helms Amendment, there are a number of Helms Amendment. I'm, I direct the Office of HIV AIDS for the District of Columbia. And there was another Helms Amendment that made it illegal for public health officials to use graphically explicit sexual images in public health images to try to help change people's behavior. Early in the epidemic, many, many local organizations were using very strong images, and there are many artists that were involved in this, uh, to to uh, produce images that would help change behavior. And uh, Jesse Helms got a hold of it, paraded around the, the floor of the Congress saying the federal government was paying for pornography, and shut them down. The federal government uh, uh, pers uh, prosecuted gay men's health crisis in New York and many, many grassroots organizations that were doing a good job. And that legacy, that still lives with us. We still have that that legislation. We still don't have uh, effective health education and people are dying every day because of that legacy. We don't have effective public health messages because it's against the law. I images can be very, very powerful things and in, in some ways I think, yes. you know, all the relationships between, you know, some of these events they have to do with, you know, us, you know, um, you know, working with the power of, of those images and, and people are afraid of them also. And so, um, you know, they, they can be used politically um, in propaganda in, in all kinds of ways. Um, and I think, you know, we've become very sophisticated about understanding how that works. And so, you know, it, 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 it's all part of it. I think, you know, the relationship between the, what you're talking about and censoring of an exhibition is, you know, not by accident um, that images are often attacked. For the uh, same reason that Phil Donahue wanted to be able to present live an execution, the imposition of the death yeah. penalty, and no network, and they wouldn't allow him to do it because of the visual impact that it might have in, in the battle against the death penalty. Hmm. Um, my question revolves around what we do going forward. Um, it seems like the culture wars are kind of starting to come back around the political climate and economic circumstances of the United States as it is right now are certainly ripe to push more of the NEA uh, cuts and everything in that realm as far as arts are concerned. It seems like we're always on the defensive and as a student here at the Corcoran and, and part of the next generation of artists that are coming up, we have a different idea about what is or isn't taboo in today's world as it was compared to during the 80s and 90s. Um, having been through this and certainly been in the trenches with the four of you up there and the vast experience that you have, what types of preemptive things or have you given consideration to or, or thought about or what your experiences are about what do we do going forward to prevent always being on the defensive? Because we look at the removal of the video from the Hide Seek show the video in the show was up for a couple of months before anything actually came out of that. It seemed like a very calculated thing that occurred. The Catholic League started this when the new G Congress was taking, <clears throat> excuse me, taking a uh, seat and it seemed like a calculated type of thing. Is there something that we should be doing to preempt this type of activity? Yes. <laughs> What, do you have suggestions for that, for the younger generation that's moving into this? Stick around for the rest of the day, first of all. Yeah, stick around for the rest of the day. I mean, I th for me it's very personal because, you know, I've gone through this experience, but, you know, in some ways, uh, the more that you can learn about, you know, the, the, the history of censorship and how it's affected, you know, all aspects of our lives and, and you, you come to an understanding of what it means uh, you know, in your everyday life, uh, I think then the more you will be uh, able to stand up and, and uh, you know, and, and speak out against it. I mean, speak out against it, that's one thing. Uh, Victoria, you've organized, you know, demonstrations of artists in, in Washington at the Smithsonian. I mean, that's one thing that, that was done that I think is, can be very effective. Um, in terms of what you can really do, I think other people here would have 
know many well, comments I think, about um, One of the things is that um, art is, uh, and Lucerca mentioned that, it's always an easy target. Is this political football that you can use every time to attack an appropriations budget, even though the budget has social welfare in it, but you want to attack it, you attack an artist who was funded by you know, $5,000 to make something that you can frame as controversial. So how can we preempt this? I think, you know, partly by making it less of a successful political move. And so far, it's been a very successful political move to, to attack the arts. Uh, so how do we make it backfire on the politicians that are doing it? How do we, you know, Boehner and Cantor are the ones that wanted um, the, the Vonorovich video out. Klopp has been the one attacked, uh, and there have been calls for his resignation. But actually, there are these congressmen that, that came in and did what they're actually constitutionally prohibited from doing, uh, which is using government funding to determine what kind of ideas should be out there. And somehow, there's no criticism of them. For them, that's, you know, that's political brownie points, great for their electorate. What is the downside for them? Well, there should be a downside. <laughs> you know, in, in researching um, the book that I wrote just after I left the corporate in the New York school, a lot of it dealt with the history of communism in the 1930s. And one of the photographers in the, 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 the school of photography that, happened, that was between 1936 and 1963 was literally hounded to his death because he was a member of the Photo League, which was a, quote, communist front organization, which, of course, was ridiculous. But, I mean, Sid Grossman, according to his widow, is still very much alive was very much a victim, um, literally, um, as an individual of, of you know, the McCarthyism of that era. And we do forget too soon. Um, there's not so much difference. I mean, the Eric Cantor, Eric Cantor is the Dick Army of his, of his time. Um, and he's very, you know, getting, getting votes all the time. He's very much out there um, dealing with, you know, one of the things that he's ferocious about is, is you know, freedom of, of expression in the artistic world, but also, um, you know, dealing with abortion clinics and, and all of that stuff. I mean, uh, the enemy is, is, is right, you know, in front of us, and we shouldn't forget. And we need to work together. We can't uh, start taking the position that, you know, it's right for me to take this battle. I don't want to join the adult industry, or I don't want to join the politician who is advocating something I don't believe, or the the, you know, the pro-choice person or whatever it may be and just being concerned selfishly about your own business. It, it goes across the board. As you start to censor one, you start to censor the other and then, then you know, we play their game and we're going to lose at it. We need to get together. We need to get demanding. We need to start looking at boycotting things. I mean, I really, um, it's, it's really epidemic. We need somebody to sit down and spend the concentrated effort of putting together what has happened historically where censorship has prevailed. And I think if we did that and we started to remind people with visual depictions, um, it may have some impact. And to stop tolerating it, we should demand of, of uh, MSNBC that, you know, don't be so critical, Glenn Beck's an asshole, but that's fine. You know, let him be that and let's support that rather than making, let's not play their game. Yeah. And let's be stronger about it, how important it is to be able to, to have that kind of stuff. And when things happen that you don't like, I think it's time you've got to write letters. You've got, the internet is out there. It is a universal news source. And start publishing things. If you're a member of Facebook, express how you feel about certain things. It's a tremendous audience out there. We need to do it. Um, you know, I just, I, I, you know, I, this isn't being melodramatic with it. I have fought, you know, I've spent my career doing this in a city that I'm just really getting some acknowledgement and respect in the court system that I didn't get because I was anti-political. I mean, I was, that was the bad guy, you know, always coming forward. And there were firm, law firms that, you know, just boycotted referring cases to me, even though I knew I was competent to handle them because they were in support of those people that were anti the maple flip and it still lingers there. You know, I've survived it and, I, and I'm, they're not gonna shut me up. 
And what I want to do is invite other people. I've been happy with my position that way. And I think you can be too. And I, I urge you all, and, and the I young can, people uh, particularly. And if I can use my moderator's privilege to add a yeah. final um, issue, I think it's important to stop being afraid of being controversial. And we've been defending the arts because it's economically um, instrument, economically it brings um, more business, it's good for the economy of a particular state or a particular place, but it's also good because it lets us talk about socially sensitive issues, i.e. because it is controversial. So controversy is not a bad thing. We should, we want arts to be controversial. We yes. want to talk about the arts. And we should be much more aggressive in defending the right of the arts to address socially divisive issues. And... Um, it's what Maple Thorpe's work was about. I mean, he really was an incredibly provocative artist. I mean, his work was in some way perfect, but also and you have to defend him for the provocativeness, not only for the formal characteristics of the work and its yeah. classical compositions. Uh, but we'll be continuing the conversation all of this afternoon.